The Vinaya tells us that after the Buddha gave his first sermon, Anyangundanya gained the Dharma Eye. In the days after that, the Buddha gave more Dharma talks. And two by two, the other of the five brethren gained the Dharma Eye as well. And then he gave the sermon that we call the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the Sutta on thyself. Well, that's a name that comes only in the commentaries. In the canon, it's called the Five for the Five Brethren. And of course, at the time, it wasn't given a name at all. It was just the talk that the Buddha gave. But it's on the topic of not self. And this is the talk that. As they listened to it, the five brethren all became arahants. Now the tradition is that the Dhanampa Chakavatana Sutta, setting the Dharma wheel in motion, was given on the full moon night in July. So it's sometime in this time of year that the Anatta Lakana Sutta was given. So it's good to think about it. The Buddha starts out with an argument for anatta that he doesn't use anywhere else. You look at each of the aggregates, you realize that they don't fall under your control. You can't have it that your form will be a certain way or your feelings will be a certain way. Perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness. If they were yourself, he said, you could have them be just the way you wanted them. Now, we can have some control over these things, but the problem is the control is not total. Then the Buddha goes on to give the questionnaire that he gave many, many times after that with each of the aggregates. Is it constant or inconstant? It's inconstant. When it's inconstant, is it stressful or is it easeful? If you're looking for happiness in it, then the fact that it's changing is not easeful at all. It is stressful. And the Buddha, instead of having them come to the conclusion from that that there is no self, he said simply, is it worthy of saying that this is me, this is mine, this is myself? He's having them pass a value judgment on each of the aggregates. In other words, it's worthy of letting go. And this is the questionnaire that enabled the five brethren to become Arahants. There's a Dharma talk that Ajahn Mahabhava gave years back where he says there seems to be something missing in the Sutta. And if you compare what the Buddha taught to the five, five brethren with what he said about Anatta and other places, there is something missing. Because here he's simply saying that the aggregates are all not self. And that was enough for them to gain awakening. There are other places, though, where he says, Sabe dhammanata, all dhammas are not self. That would include not only fabricated things, but also unfabricated things. And there's a passage in the suttas that explains why. The Buddha talks about how you can focus on the mind and concentration. And the, the five brethren were in concentration. This may be one of the topics that the Buddha talked about in the time between the first and the second sermon. After all, in the first sermon, he mentions the five aggregates but doesn't define them. He mentions the names of the factors of the Eightfold Path but doesn't define them. So maybe those were among the topics that were covered. There's also a passage where the Buddha explains how it is that people can gain awakening while they're listening to a Dharma talk. He basically says they listen to the talk, they follow it, 
there's a sense of joy. From the sense of joy, the mind becomes serene. And when the mind becomes serene, then becomes concentrated. So you can look at the mind in concentration and see that the concentration is made up of the, those five aggregates. That other passage in the suttas then goes on to explain that you incline the mind to the deathless. And then if you still have some passion for that deathless, then you will be fully awakened. You have the experience, but there is some clinging still. So you have to let go of that as well. This is the part that's missing in the Anatta Lakana Sutta. But there's another passage in the Jamahabu which explains why. He says that attachment to what seems to be deathless, even though we've had, you actually have had an experience of the deathless, but you cover it over with some very subtle, subtle levels of aggregates. So it may have been the case that in the many times when that questionnaire of, are the aggregates worthy of being called self, was enough to, for people to become arahants, simply because they could see that those subtle levels of the aggregates were still there, covering over the experience of the deathless, and they were able to cut those away as well. And the genuine deathless appeared. Now this may seem very abstract, but it makes a very practical point, even when you're not quite there with the deathless. But when something really still and peaceful comes up in the meditation, don't immediately brand it as being, being the goal. There may still be some levels of aggregates covering it up. You see this everywhere, people saying there's a sense of space around the events of your mind. It seems to be unconditioned. The unconditioned is everywhere, we're sometimes told. Just tap into it. But you have to look at it. Is there still any level of stress in there? You have to familiarize yourself with it, stick with it for long periods of time. Because if you settle on saying that something is deathless and unconditioned when it's not, then you cut off any further progress in the path. So whatever comes up in your meditation, even as you're moving from one level of concentration to another, it's the same issue. Get the mind really still, as still as you can, and then try to maintain that, both to gain the strength that comes from a concentrated mind, and to test it, to see exactly where this too is fabricated. In some cases, it's going to, it's going to be like going into a very bright room after having been in the dark. The light is so bright that you can't see anything. As far as you're concerned, there's nothing in the room. But after a while, your eyesight will adjust, and you begin to say, oh yeah, there's furniture here. There are things here. Simply I, was, I wasn't adjusted to them yet to see what was there. So the test always is, is there a level of stress going on? And way of test, one way of testing for it is to see, is there any up and down? Because that's how the ajans of noted, okay, if, uh, if this has to be maintained, if there's any stress coming up, stress going down, even if it's subtle. The fact that you have to maintain it means that it's fabricated. It's a, if it's fabrication, it's not the goal. Of 
question came up recently. When the Buddha was on his quest, he was able to recognize that even in the attainments that he was learned from his first teachers, the dimension of nothingness, the dimension of neither perception and non-perception, how was it that he was able to see that these things were, were not the deathless? Was it because he had become a stream enter in a previous lifetime when he had been studying under another Buddha? Well, the canon doesn't say. The canon simply says he recognized that it was not deathless. And if we try to throw the reasons back to previous lifetimes, it doesn't encourage us to look at what's actually going on right before our eyes. Because that's what the Buddha was able to do. He saw right before his eyes that this attainment is fabricated. So it can't be the deathless. It can't be the goal. So that's what you want to look for. So am I doing anything to maintain this? And look very carefully. And get used to doing this as the mind settles down. Because that's how you move, say, from the first jhana to the second jhana. You realize that to maintain the mind in the first, you have to use directed thought, evaluation. In other words, you have to talk to yourself on a very subtle level about what's going on. But that directed thought and evaluation, it's not a constant drone. There'll be some comments, and then you'll watch. There'll be some comments, and you'll watch. You begin to realize just the watching on its own is a lot more restful. And then you can ask yourself, can you stay there without the comments? When you find that you can, then you can move into a deeper concentration. Then you repeat the process. You stay here. And you begin to gain the sense that even the rapture, which is one of the reasons you like the concentration to begin with, is becoming a bit much. And again, the rapture comes in waves, and then it goes. Comes in waves, and then it goes. How about just focusing on the state of mind when it goes? Now, sometimes you're not able to maintain your balance that way, so you go back to where you were before. But when you find that you can maintain your balance in the new, more subtle level, you go for it. We you keep this up all the time. Settle in, then watch. Look for any subtle variations in the level of stress. And drop whatever it is that's causing the stress. This is how we progress in the meditation, by developing our powers of alertness and awareness, knowing how to ask the right questions, and focusing on what's happening right now. You don't have to make any assumptions about what attainments you may have had in a previous lifetime. If you think about it, how they were there, you may get careless this time around. If you think that you have no attainments from a previous lifetime, you may get discouraged. The previous lifetimes are out of the question right now. It's, it's what's happening right now. That's what you've got to watch. So watch. Be still in order to see clearly. And ask the right questions in order to gain insight. And this is how Tranquility and insight work together to improve your concentration, to move you further along, until there is no further to go. And one of the ways in which you'll know is because you've got really good at watching what's happening in the mind. Your ability to observe your own mind here in real time to 
that's what deepens your meditation.